Pleasant good morning, everybody. Start of a new week here as uh, we dive deeply into the dog days of summer on Five Reasons Sports Network. It's another edition of Defo on Five. I'm Jeff DeForest along with, uh, well, I mean, now the world-renowned producer yeah. slash co-host, uh, director of the program here, uh, Mr. Mike <coughs> Luby Lubitz. Um, how are you, Luby? Because uh, I have a real big problem developing here. It's evolving. Uh, I'm not sure if I could qualify this as a medical condition. But at 72, you start to worry about things like this. Uh, I'm going to be 72 in a week and a half now. Countdown is on. I only have till Wednesday of next week to complete my vital transformation. <laughs> we started it. <laughs> so far, I'm fucking it up pretty good, man. You know me, the prince of procrastination. I keep telling myself, well, I'll get this going tomorrow. But, but I'm having a problem, and I don't know if there's anybody in the medical field out there that can help me out. And I started to touch on this uh, last week, but but it's getting worse. And that is, uh, I can't get this song out of my head from Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> I mean, it, it's how deep is your love? How deep is your love? And I, I can't get rid of it. I, I know we had a, a very interesting and revealing interview with uh, Debbie Boone a long time ago. And uh, she, she was very forthright in saying, hey, it's not my fault. It was the old thing. <laughs> Out of Goodwill Hunting, hunting yeah. right? When Robin Williams just says to Matt Damon, it's not your fault. <laughs> and, <laughs> the guy sucked. And, uh, you know, for years, You Light Up My Life was stuck in my head, and I hated it. I, I really did. You light up my life. Now, in general, you would have to say good song, but it's not something that you want stuck in your head permanently, especially if you're a guy. You're out there betting with, uh, you know, people at the track. You're hanging out with degenerates and slobs and low lives and scumbags and the usual characters that I associate myself with, with the exception of Luby. And uh, you good people out there, the, the people that I, I know personally or uh, even as an acquaintance, all great people. But uh, I tend to gravitate to, towards the macabre. I tend to gravitate towards the dark side. I'm kind of like James Conn in the original version of The Gambler. And so, uh, you know, how, how do you reveal to somebody that uh, the song that's in your head is, you light up my life <laughs> without taking a beating? And uh, now it's how deep is your, I should have never turned this movie on. And then what happened that exacerbated the situation, Luby, I know this has nothing to do with anything that you guys want to talk about, but maybe you've had this problem because even on my walk of life where uh, I, I walk about four miles every day and uh, that's, what's keeping me going. I, I believe that's the one thread that I have of uh, decency when it comes to uh, trying to maintain some modicum of health. And I, I think it's keeping me going. I, I really do. And, and it's good. You know, I mean, if you can walk four miles every day, you, you have to be in some kind of shape. No? What do you think, Luby? That's nice. That's a doesn't nice matter walking. how slow the pace is. I mean, I know women are passing me with walkers with four tennis balls on the, <laughs> the legs. Going, hey, you're out there again today, DeForest. Nice. You want to pick up the pace a little bit? <laughs> It's, uh, I'm like, I don't know if you saw this, Louis, but it was interesting out of the sporting world. And uh, I forget what country it was. I, I think it might have been Haiti mm. was in some world uh, track and field meet. And uh, in, in order to uh, qualify and not get disqualified, DQ'd from the whole event, they, they had to have somebody enter the like 60 meter, 100 meter low hurdles. Uh, but uh, all of their hurdlers were injured. So they put this shot putter in there, and she ran the uh, hurdles, like a 100-yard uh, low hurdle race, in 36 seconds. <laughs> but she just had to get in there. She literally was, like, stepping over the hurdles, you know, like pushing them down and walking over them. And, uh, you know, she, she was, like, 300 pounds. I mean, she was a shot putter. And uh, she got in there. And that's kind of what my pace uh, is all about. But uh, I ended up uh, I'm, I'm flipping channels the other day, and, and what pops up again but Saturday Night Fever so I watched some more of the movie no. to figure out, I, did he win the Oscar for this or just get a nomination, John Travolta? I don't think he got an Oscar. I don't think he won to, to tell you the truth, the actual plot of the movie and the script and everything and, and the uh, acting in general, what a piece of shit this movie was. If it wasn't for the BG soundtrack, it never would have made it. And, and then why does this song have to get stuck in my head? I, I can't get it out of my head. Even on my walk of life, I'm sitting there going, uh, how deep is your love? I'm humming along to that. People are passing me going, what, what the fuck? You're singing that song? Get out of here. Get off the streets. Use the bike path. Do something. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so that's been plaguing me through the weekend. Now, the other thing that used to plague us here in South Florida is the dog days of summer. 
where if you were in a countdown, especially if you were in the sports talk business and you were in a countdown until training camp opens so you could make these astute observations. And I feel for, you know, some of the people, I guess, you know, there are people that are very good at this, Luby. What do you think? Uh, we were out at a zillion training camps when we were doing the 940 win show, and we were the flagship at one point for the Miami Dolphins. So and naturally, you know, we, we were sent out there for the opening of training camp and several other times where the Dolphins would request, hey, why don't you guys come out to training camp and do a completely meaningless show while nobody's out there on the field? And we're thinking, yeah, that's a good idea. Why don't we go out there in 100-degree heat, uh, you know, have those giant <laughs> fans blowing in the background there so you can't hear a word anybody say, what? Like Joe Philbin sitting right next to us. Well, we wouldn't have known if he was saying anything anyway, would we, with Joe Philbin? And, uh, you, know, you couldn't hear a word the guy was saying. That was it. I mean, the highlight of all of that was that, uh, and we didn't realize this, we, we mentioned it a few times because it still shocks me to this day, and I can still envision how this all transpired, that, that it turned out that the defensive coaching staff of the Miami Dolphins loved our show to the point where that's what they discussed in team meetings, which may be a reason why <laughs> they ended up giving up 47 <laughs> points a game at the end of the season, and the defensive coordinator was fired. But they were big fans of the show. I guess, uh, you know, the, a couple of the coaches had similar backgrounds as me uh, growing up in New York, and, uh, and they loved it, and, and they did a perfect Luby imitation, and that was yeah. fantastic. That, that was really about the only thing that we ever got out of all of those training camps, except when Smoke and Joe Philbin acknowledged that uh, he was aware of the nickname Smoke and Joe Philbin and actually liked it. <laughs> Which, I mean, it's not disparaging to call a guy Smoke and Joe Philbin. It was just, you know, somewhat facetious because it wasn't as if he had this, you know, stellar, uh, you know, a lightning rod type of personality. You weren't going to, I mean, Jimmy Johnson was very engaging. You meet Jimmy Johnson and right away you feel like, wow, I met somebody that uh, really has it going on. When we met Joe Philbin, it's like, man, what a schlep. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> anyway, we used to be relegated to uh, having to do the countdown to uh, Miami Dolphins training camp, uh, so we'd have something to discuss here, and, and that's not the case anymore. Unless you wanted to get into this, Luby, which I found fascinating today, another way to uh, separate you from your capital uh, being presented by all of these uh, various uh, betting proposition uh, items that are out there for your consumption, your public consumption. Uh, you can now bet. Uh, who will finish not just first in the uh, AFC East, but first and second. You get odds on if you can predict who's going to finish in exact order. You have to hit an exacta now. First and second in the AFC East. Now, that could get kind of funky because, well, I, I guess there are different qualifiers that would eventually be tiebreakers if two teams ended up with, say, let, let's just go, for example, the, the winner's 12-5 and five of the division and second place is two 10-7 and seven teams. So I guess they, they decide that via the tiebreaker who actually finished second in the division. Not that it would matter that much, but uh, the tiebreaker would be a criteria for deciding uh, whether or not a team made it to the playoffs with that kind of record. Uh, so if you do you like the Dolphins to win the AFC East at all? Are, are you a fan of that? Because these odds seem kind of low to me, considering that you not only have to bet the Dolphins to win the division, which I, I would think would be what? at least a six to one proposition, something like that. I, you have to consider that the bills will repeat as your uh, number one uh, thought. And then uh, you, you would think that the jets probably are, are in there toe to toe with the Miami dolphins, good team all the way around, except for the quarterback position. Now they have a quarterback uh, also figure to improve. A lot of their guys that were huge contributors last year uh, were, were, were rookies. So you no, know, they, they only figure to get better. Correct. Yes. Better, better uh, all the way around. Uh, so, so you have to consider them. Um, but the uh, Miami Dolphins, if you wanted to bet the Dolphins to finish first in a division and the Bills to finish second, you're, you're only getting plus 550, which I would think uh, would be about the right price for the Miami Dolphins alone, no? Now you have to pick second place between, and nobody, everyone is discounting the Patriots, which probably is logical, but uh, nonetheless, I mean, they're still in a division. They still have Belichick. They still have various methods, uh, unscripted <laughs> as they may be, of finding ways to win. <laughs> Is Mac Jones a bust? Well, I'm wrong about Mac Jones, Libby, and you were right. I, I almost hate to admit that. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm willing to throw in a towel on Mac Jones. What do you think, Mac you Jones? You don't have to. I mean, they benched him. Last yeah, first he was hurt, but then he wasn't hurt, and they were playing some guy no one had ever heard of yeah. over him, and then they shopped him this summer, and no one wanted him. But, I mean, I guess he's still there. 
It's not looking so good for me. It's looking a lot better for you. Anyway, what, what do you think? I mean, if you believe the Dolphins are going to win the division, would you be willing to fuck up that money by uh, trying to predict who's going to finish second yeah, between the Bills and the Jets if you're going to discount the Patriots? Right, I, you're, I, you're not getting enough of a price on this. Dolphins Jets is plus eight fifty. Dolphins Bills plus five fifty. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, would, I would think it's a long shot. No, all three teams to me, if they're not on the same level, they're close, and yeah. I just want to see what they look like. Like the Bills. Some presume they're just going to keep growing. Some think they may have hit their zenith and may go the other way. Um, the Jets, everyone's really high on them. And you would think, look, if they were doing all that without a competent So, so you know that's going to be deflating. Look, look at the Mets, uh, predictions for the Mets. That's my they're thing. Mess, like, yeah. everyone, all they do who are high on the Jets is because they're doing the thing you just said. They're assuming, well, those guys are really good without a quarterback. Put in a quarterback. How good would they be? Yeah, but you don't know what it'll be. You just don't know. You hey, don't nobody know. was going to beat Miami when they got LeBron, Bosch, and Wade. And uh, remember that bar down there, uh, Whiskey Tango, I think it was called? It's a good in Hollywood, and they offered like a free tab up to $25 to anybody who was hanging around if the Heat lost a game, and they lost like, uh, what were they, like 8 and 17 or something? Well, 9 huh? and 8 to start. <laughs> yeah, 9 and 8 out of their first 17. This guy was eating it every night. They're out of business, by the way. Yeah, I, you know, probably still suffering and, and never being able to dig their way out from the red ink they were swimming in after the Miami Heat got off to that awful start. Uh, anyway, uh, this all leads up to, uh, and uh, we only have a couple of minutes left here in our uh, time on uh, D four one five. But uh, can we ride the Marlins out now? They have a big week coming up here: three against Boston, three against the Braves. A six game road trip that begins tomorrow night in Beantown with our ace on the mound, or. Is he the ace, or uh, has he been reduced down to uh, maybe like uh, not even the jack of spades at this point? Ooh. Talking about Sandy Alcantara. Right now, he ain't the ace. <laughs> right now, he's like their fourth starter. He's been abysmal. He's had one good start in the last like month plus. And, and we have Fernando Mania going on in this town. I, I, I was a huge fan of uh, all of these things where, where one pitcher catches fire and captures the imagination of the country. And whether you're a baseball fan or not, it's just kind of like the uh, 98 home run race with Sosa and McGuire, where it didn't matter who you were. Like like secretaries were coming up to you at the radio station going, hey, did Sammy hit one last night, Defo? Yep, yep, yep. Everybody was all over it. When Mark the Bird Fidrich pitched, that, that was uh, must-see TV. Fernando Mania in 1981 was just a, a phenomenon. That was my last year in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I remember, I mean, you couldn't help but be captured and, and caught up in it. Because uh, he, he was such an engaging character. Now, I, I don't know that Yuri Perez uh, ha- has that kind of appeal. And then the other you know, side of it is uh, Fernando Valenzuela was also a lot of fun when he was at bat. So that enhanced the whole aura of Fernando Mania. And, and here was this uh, sort of chubby Mexican kid that was making it with the L.A. Dodgers. Supposedly uh, broke into baseball when he was 16, but he was actually 36. There <laughs> was a lot of charm to that story. Now, Yuri Perez came in, uh, you know, people had talked about him, but, uh, you know, this was uh, the boy who cried wolf with the Marlins, where how many of these phenoms have we seen come through here that we say, oh, I can't wait to see so-and-so pitch? Sixto was the name that stands out because he had an unusual name. But everybody thought, my God, can't wait. Where is he today? Sixto Sanchez. I don't talk about him at all. Is he in baseball? He's with the Marlins, and they're bringing him back slowly, quote-unquote, but they, they don't even mention him. They don't talk about him, and... The problem is they have all these other guys that have risen to the occasion. And Their starting look, pitching has been spot on, as they say. Look, the worst pitcher is Alcantara, who is the reigning Cy Young winner. Like, that's the fucking weird thing about this. Look, my only thing I'll say about that is, and a lot of people are liking it to Dontrell, and I love Dontrell. The Dontrell run was really fun. That was phenomenal. But Dontrell, if you watched him pitch, it was more about the fucking Fakak, the way he threw it. And I felt like at some point, much like Hideo Nomo, it wasn't about his stuff. It was the way he pitched, and eventually, like they did, they caught up to him, and then a few years later, he had another really good year, but he was never, and then the, when the Tigers traded for him, he was a disaster. Like Never duplicated. He wasn't a great pitcher. He was a fun story. And Valenzuela, I feel like, was that as well. He was a really No, Valenzuela story. was a great pitcher. Was he great? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I was I was super young. I don't know. Uh, he, he, he was good. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, that year he was phenomenal. His record wasn't even that great yet that year, but uh, he was phenomenal. Uh, actually, the comparison is valid because uh, uh, Yuri Perez, after six scoreless uh, yesterday, it was an afternoon game, has an ERA through nine starts of 1.34. 
Yeah. And uh, there are only two guys through their first nine starts in Major League Baseball. The second one, uh, I forget, but one was Fernando, who had a lower earn run average through nine starts. Uh, Fernando's was point oh nine three. Jesus. Yeah, a point uh, yeah, a 0.93. Yeah. So uh, that's, you know, and, and there was one other pitcher that had nine starts where his ERA was lower than Perez, but Perez has been phenomenal. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk more about that on the Defoe Show. we got to run right now, but uh, due to certain time constraints. Uh, so we'll uh, be with you from 7 to 9 live on the Defoe Show. Flip over there if uh, you're catching this uh, live right now here on Five Reasons. And uh, for uh, Mike Luby Lubitz, I'm Jeff DeForest. That's kind of, I guess we took up too much time there complaining about uh, you light up my life. <laughs> what you won't do for love. Oh, my God. I, I, I want to strangle Barry Gibb. <laughs> but there's only one remaining BG, so I'm unlikely to do that. Scratch that from the record, by the way. Uh, we'll see you next time on the next edition of TFO on 5.